So at this point, it looks like we do have a few questions in the Q&A, so I can pause for that. And then if um, anybody has additional questions, um, you know, just keep entering those. Kristen, um, I can read. Yeah, if somebody wants to read the questions, that'd be, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yes, it looks like a user can, has to specify a volume before they know whether or not the item they're requesting has multiple volumes. Um, that's true, I guess, especially in the staff interface. Um, in, the, in the discovery interface, which is how a patron would typically be placing their request, they should have a little bit more information about that. And I can um, quickly bring up, um, actually, let's bring this one up if we can. Uh, this is the discovery layer that we're working on for Connect New York, which um, is our other consortium that's in the process of implementing ReShare. Um, and so I'll just do um, a search here. So if you're coming from more of a, a typical discovery layer, um, I'm not sure if we're going to see anything that has um, multiple volumes. It's a little bit difficult, but um, you know there there should be information here that makes it a little bit clearer that there are multiple volumes. Um, we'll eventually be having availability information here. So you know, tip, the typical workflow would that be that the patron is searching discovery layer and then hitting this request button here. So they, they hopefully have a little bit more information of that. Whereas the staff view, I mean, you know, you're probably going to be working with a patron or be in a little bit more of an unusual circumstance. So I think that um, that sort of just assumes that you might have information that's coming from another place. Great. Um, next question is from Louisa Swinsky. How long will the request remain in the requires review? Queue? Does it time out and move on, or does uh, it stay I, there? Or does it stay there until a staff processes it? Yeah, at this point, it stays there until a staff member processes it. Um, and there will be um, when you're sort of in reshare. I mean, this is just a test system, so it's a little. Um, the data in here, you can see I've just been preparing for this demo, but you'll actually be able to filter by the state that something's in. And we ultimately aim to have a bunch of different requires review states so that you'd be able to kind of come in and we might even add something like a dedicated requires reveal, review filter. So you'd be kind of able to easily come in and work through any requests that are in kind of a, an exceptional state uh, that require staff attention. Um, but I did also want to add that kind of an auto forward mechanism, and that would apply not just to locally available requests, but anything that a supply has been assigned to a supplier, um, where we'd be able to have a rule in place that would say, you know, after X days, just move this on to the next supplier if nothing has happened, uh, because you know, sometimes people are out or you know, things just start to languish. And so uh, that's definitely something that we know people want to see. Great. Um, next question also from Louisa is will patron name, uh, will patron name info only be visible to borrowing library staff as a privacy uh, issue? Yeah, that's been one where we've had a little bit of a challenge in kind of balancing privacy and workflow. Um, so what we're doing right now is uh, trying to minimize the exposure of patron information on the supplier side. So you can see I'm looking at this from a requester point of view. I'm seeing patron in my results and I can also search by the requester's name. Uh, when I go over to the supplier point of view, you know, we don't have that information displaying. And when I look at the request details, I also don't see that. Um, the one thing that we've sort of had to compromise on is the pull slip. So I can go ahead, if I print the pull slip, we've got the patron's name here at the top, just because we really heard that having the patron's name on the pull slip is so useful that people really want it there. But typically that slip gets printed on the supplier side. Uh, but we do have an issue in our backlog to, to do sort of an anonymized lending feature that would maybe have some different options like not having the name on the pull slip and then potentially even 
a completely anonymized feature that might not have patron information at all, but just kind of rely on the local system in some way for that. So um, that probably would be a little bit down the road, but we have heard that coming up as a priority for a lot of people. Great, thanks. Um, Andrea Loigman asks, will the reshare due date update if, reno if renewals go through the ILS? At this point, it won't. Uh, renewals are another thing that we have in our backlog that we need to figure out how to address through reshare. Um, you know, a lot of the consortia that we're working with, especially our two implementers, you'll notice this due date uh, is not until September. So that the typical approach is to have a very long consortial loan period uh, so that the patron may actually have a shorter loan period and might even renew this once or twice between now and September. And then that due date is really just when it needs to go back to the supplier. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately we will want to have a little bit more robust feature to be able to request renewals in the system, update due dates and that kind of thing. Great. Going to combine two questions, both on documentation. Um, one is asking if there is IT technical documentation available and another which is asking what training documentation is available. Yes, so we have um, a wiki and I could quickly pull this up. Uh, this is kind of in progress, um, but we can we can share this so I can even add this to the slides um, if we're gonna send out uh, a follow-up. But we have a little bit of documentation here. So we're working on documentation for returnables and for the shared inventory. And that's really more focused on end user documentation. And Palsy, as one of our early implementers, has been collaborating with us on that. So we're, they're uh, kind of working on expanding this and we should be kind of rolling out a new version of this site pretty soon. Uh, and we are planning to also try to add some video documentation to this site as well. Um, and then we also have this kind of getting started guide and um, if you are really interested in installing the software and, and dealing with the technical side of it, this kind of gives you a, a way that you can get started and install basically a test version of ReShare. Um, it's pretty complex to deploy. And so I would recommend that if this is something you're interested in, you know, you can definitely check out this page and take a look, but it might, you might also want to get in touch with us um, just to let us know what you're doing and we might be able to provide a little bit of guidance on that. Thanks, Kristen. Um, next question is um, from Nikki Rierich. Um, are there any plans to update the process of scanning twice for fulfilling and shipping a request and returning and shipping a request to a single option? Yes, that's another request that we've had. Um, and, and I think that's a point where different libraries have different workflows. Some people might actually have a long delay or hopefully not long, but some delay between um, you know, getting something ready to ship and shipping if that's being performed in two different places. Whereas some people, they kind of want to do that as one step. So we'd like to have a more configurable workflow where you could actually decide which steps you want or potentially bypass particular steps. Um, one thing I think in the, you know, currently the way things work is that if you are, you know, holding this item in your hand and you're, you're packing it, you can just kind of scan, scan, like two scans in rapid succession to get that to the shipped state. So we're hoping that it's not a huge burden on people in the short term. And then we'll be looking at kind of those customization of workflows later on. Okay. Um, and... Next question from Amanda Kramer, are there batch processing and or automation features available for these workflows? Uh, yes, there are batch processing uh, features. So we have our update app. And basically what this app lets you do is to choose some uh, an action. So say you had a bunch of stuff that you were shipping um, you could choose the mark request shipped action. And if you just had kind of a pile of books and they all have those pull slips on or in them, you kind of go down the line and scan them all quickly. Um, and that would perform the action just uh, over and over again. Um, and I don't know if I have anything in this system that's in a good state to be able to show that, probably not. Um, 
but but that's that's kind of the idea and we may also add some additional actions like right now you can um receive things or you can complete requests but we might do kind of like a, a master receive action that would be just incoming materials regardless of whether you're the supplier or the requester and the system would sort of know based on what state the item is in what the the logical next step is so i think we'll be expanding this area as well okay and then a follow-up um from louisa about the technical documentation the it staff uh were asking about uh, technical documentation from a data security standpoint uh yeah that's actually coming up lately because we are working with our implementers on uh, SSO integrations for ViewFind. And so a number of libraries require some kind of technical security documentation. And so we just have recently um, completed a form that's called the Heck That Light, which I think is a fairly standard form used in higher education for that. Um, and so we have that available for anybody who needs it. And we actually should put, put that on the wiki along with the supporting documentation that way uh, people can just go straight there and get what they need. So um, I hope I'm hopeful that will fill that need for a lot of libraries. Those are all the questions we have in the Q and A. Um, I think Lisa may have identified someone who raised their hand. I want to give her a chance to see if we can unmute that person. Hi, Brian. I saw your hand raised, and um, we have unmuted you and Tony, I see your hand raised and I will unmute you right now as well. So both or either of you could go ahead and ask your questions. Well, Brian, first, I simply, I must have accidentally clicked the raised hand, my apologies. So my hands are not raised, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, and I think, the, you. yeah, you're welcome. And I think the other person who had a raised hand also has put their hand down. So I think we're good, Tim. Great. Those are all the questions we have. Great. Well, thank you. Those were really good questions. Um, glad to be able to engage about that. So I'm going to head back to the slides and I just have um, a couple slides just to talk a little bit about what's planned for the reshare roadmap, um, kind of picking up on what Tim was talking about with our retreat and, and what's coming up. So in terms of our near term roadmap that's kind of firmly planned, uh, we're hoping to have a small release um, with, in mid June. And the main goal of that is really just to try to push out some additional ILS integrations that are needed by our early implementers. So that would be for Koha, Millennium, TLC, and Voyager. And then we are looking at having um, another release. In, at the end of July that would have some more uh, features there. And some of the things we're working on are a real-time availability service for our discovery tools so that you'd actually be able to see what's on the shelf at each library. Um, some better patron management features. So we're working on um, being able to manage patrons, manage patron types, and to be able to block requesting based on the type of user. And then we're also working on some support for multi-volume requests. So being able to associate more than one item record with a request if you have multiple volumes. And then at this point, we've kind of earmarked our next release. Uh, that would be in the fall for bug fixes and priority enhancements that we know will be coming up from our early implementers. And also to try to use that time to do some uh, addressing of technical debt and stability features. So really almost just a little bit of, of a pause in new, big new feature development so that we can make sure we have the capacity to be responsive and that things are kind of stable. And then from there, uh, we'll be kind of we'll be diving into our backlog for reshare returnables. And so, actually, I think the questions that came up during the demo are a great uh, example of just how much there is still to do for returnables. And I think a lot of things people asked about are probably represented on this list or on a more complete list somewhere. Um, but there's there's really a lot that we can still do with returnables that will kind of uh, 
make this system even more um, you know, smooth and full featured and uh, the kind of advanced system we know people want it to be. And there's some areas that we'll be looking at. Um, we have our shared index and a lot of the work to be done there is around um, better record matching and data management as we try to build these shared catalogs. Um, for resource sharing, you know, we have a lot that we could do, claims, renewals, uh, loan rules, anonymized lending, auto advance. So, I mean, those are all just kind of resource sharing features that are gonna make the system better and better. Integrations, we definitely wanna keep working on that. We wanna be able to sort of push failed requests out to other services. Um, and so are interested in trying to see how we can communicate with non-reshare systems because we use the ISO 18626 protocol. We should be able to work with other systems that are also using that protocol. So there's some interesting opportunities there. Um, delivery, you know, working on shipping is something that we wanted to come back to for a long time. Uh, the pandemic kind of, uh, Put that priority a bit lower, but I, I think it maybe will be coming back around. And then consortium management as well, being able to provide some features that would help those who work at a consortium to get easier access to all their libraries and to be able to do things like um, have more sophisticated request routing and, and to think about how do things work when you have more than one consortia and how do you load balance across consortia. So uh, there's there's quite a bit that we can do. I also did highlight a few here with STARS. Um, you know, we have uh, some consortia joining reshare in the last several months who have a mix of library types, so public, academic, school, and uh, those groups for, for various reasons, some of these features are of special interest to them. And so getting some of these done are really gonna make the difference in terms of getting reshare to a point where different types of consortia will feel that it's ready for them to be able to implement. And so in terms of our next steps and how we are going to address all of this, um, one of the things that we have on our to-do list is to reconvene our reshare product management team. So this is a group that was very er active early on in the project, um, kind of defining uh, the, the general feature requirements and kind of scoping what that initial minimum viable product would look like to get us to a point where, where people can implement. Um, and then as we completed that work, that group went on hiatus. So now that we have the opportunity to start prioritizing um, some of our, new, our next release cycles looking into the fall, we wanna get this team back together to kind of review all those backlog features and start to prioritize and start to think about what should we focus on. Um, and then that group will also work with our subject matter experts team uh, as we'll have to really dive into those features and develop requirements and mock-ups and workflows and, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll be getting back to a little bit of what we did early on in the project where we're really going into more of a design phase uh, probably won't be as intense because we're not starting from the ground up, but uh, it's a bit of a renewal of that work. And then, it, of course, as Tim mentioned, we will continue looking for ways to expand beyond returnables. Um, but right now, we really feel like as we have people going live, we kind of have to commit to supporting and enhancing that. And then, you know, as new members or potentially new funding sources come, come in, we may be able to set set up some sort of parallel development efforts in areas like CDL or non-returnables. And so um, I'm just gonna wrap up my portion here with a little bit of a kind of call to action on how people might get involved. And so this first opportunity is really aimed at existing reshare members to think about uh, potentially joining our product management team. Uh, we're really kind of rebuilding this group from the ground up. So there, there will be opportunities to join the group. And that would be open to anybody who is either their library is a member of reshare or they're a member of a, their library is a member of a consortia who is a member of Project Reshare. Uh, we're aiming to get around 10 people for this group. Uh, the goal will be to prioritize uh, and schedule features for these releases. 
time commitment, we usually would meet once a week for an hour and then there may be a couple hours of uh, work to do outside of the meeting. So it's not a huge time commitment. Um, and we're really trying to get uh, representatives who will have kind of the span of knowledge that ReShare intersects with. So that includes discovery, cataloging, shared cataloging, resource sharing and consortial work. So there, there's a, a broad range of things that are gonna go into this. So this is uh, something, if you're interested, you can email me, um, I said by June 15th, and uh, we'll probably send out an email reminder about this as well um, for anyone who's interested in that. Um, in terms of other ways to get involved, you know, uh, sort of mentioning that that opportunity is for members only or existing members at this point. Um, so just getting involved in the reshare project as a whole is something to think about if it's something your library or consortia might be interested in. Um, we have a, a page on our site, Get Involved, that talks a little bit about our current membership model and how you can get in touch if you're interested in joining. And I did just want to mention as well that we are kind of flexible on, on the membership model. And so if you see that and you think, well, I can't afford that or that doesn't quite work for me, uh, don't let that uh, kind of box you out. Like we're happy to talk about alternatives, the in-kind contributions as Tim was mentioning. So we really do value um, everyone's participation and we wanna work with you to help you get involved. And then we do also have other opportunities for uh, existing ReShare members. So we have a few teams, our subject matter expert team, which is really kind of like a resource sharing pr uh, practitioners who help us define requirements at a very granular level. We have our community engagement and communications teams, which kind of help uh, keep the project going in terms of getting people involved and uh, getting news out about reshare. And then we also have community contributions. And these are kind of like individuals and individual projects that some of our members have put people forward for um, that can help us in different ways. And that can be things like contributing a developer to the project, um, but it could also be contributing work in an area of expertise, like uh, re writing reports or doing a UX review. And so this is really a segue into the next part of the meeting, which is that we have invited um, three of our existing community contributors to give um, some short talks about the work that they're doing with ReShare and what that experience has been like. And so at this point, um, I think I'll just pause to see if there's any questions. And if not, we can move on to those lightning talks. There are no more questions. Actually, one question just popped up. Um, it sounds like this is from Margaret, uh, Margaret Ellingson. It sounds like development will continue in, in, in a consortial context for quite a while. I'm guessing it's too early to estimate when the focus will go beyond. Yeah, I think that is probably true at this point. Um, you know, we have talked in terms of the larger vision for reshare about going beyond the consortial resource sharing point of view and having more of a kind of open global resource sharing where anyone using reshare can lend or borrow from anyone else. Um, but yeah, we're not quite there yet. So I think we'll kind of have to see how that evolves and, and what resources become available. I think we may have lost Tim as well. Kristen, I can read out any questions that come in while Tim rejoins, but, and there aren't any other ones for now. Okay. Okay, well then at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn this over to Sean, who is our first lightning talk. Hey everybody, I'm just gonna share screen here. Okay, um, so my name is Sean Swick and I work for MCLS. Uh, we are a consortium based out of Michigan, but we serve libraries in both Michigan and Indiana. And we are one of the consortial members that Tim was talking about uh, earlier. And I'm gonna talk about some of the work we've done around reporting for eShare. So obviously 
everyone who does ILL needs reports on what's happening in the system. So that's kind of what we're working on. Um, so first, I just wanted to mention uh, who's involved, because it's obviously not just me. Um, there are a number of people involved right now. Obviously, Kristen, she, you know, um, keeps all of us in line and keeps us in order and keeps us organized. Um, and then Naseeb from Index Data has been very involved. He is one of the big developers of the library data platform, which I'll mention in a minute, which is kind of one of the two building blocks for what we're building. And then myself and then Andrew Sarno from uh, Penn Libraries, he's uh, joined us and he's working to help us with what we're doing. Um, so what we're doing is we're basically building a uh, repository of reports that libraries can use or basically writing the queries for them. And then you'll be able to essentially take these queries and run them against your reshare data and get your results that you're looking for. Um, so the community really, um, I believe it was a lot of the people from the subject matter experts group, the different SMEs, um, defined what kind of reports they needed in their system. And I think the list, it was somewhere around like 35 different reports um, that the group was looking for. And um, different, <laughs> the different kind of reports that people were looking for. And um, then they kind of prioritized them into, you know, different priorities, high, middle, low. And um, we're going from there and trying to develop uh, as many as we can. Um, so as I mentioned, there's two kind of building blocks, the library data platform, which has been developed. And essentially that is uh, a tool that is used to pull data out of different systems. Right now it's being used really for Folio and ReShare, essentially pulls the data out of those systems and puts them kind of in your standard kind of database, relational database model so that you can query them and do kind of, you know, reporting and analytics on them. And then the Folio Analytics project, which some of you who use Folio might be aware of, um, is another project that's being uh, that's been worked on, doing the same thing, basically taking the data out of the library data platform and doing some analysis on what's going on inside of Folio systems. So we've kind of used those two um, projects as kind of a base, and we've started um, developing different queries and providing a lot of feedback um, to to Naseeb to basically say, okay. Here's how the data we're working for Folio. Here's are some changes we're going to need to make to make it work and reshare. Um, so that work kind of continues um, as we move forward. Um, and obviously, I put some links here so people want to follow along with kind of our progress. Um, they can see where we are. We have a few um, queries we've already put up there, and we continue to move forward. And we hope to have uh, at least the highest priority ones. Um, ready for the early implementers in a few months. Um, so does anyone have any questions about that? And we can also have time for questions at the end of all the okay. lightning talks. So um, if people think of those, just feel free to, to add questions about any of the talks and we'll come back to it. Perfect. So I will right, stop and share. No problem. Thanks, Kristen. Okay, and then next up we have, um, I think Joel is going to be presenting from Western Carolina University. Yeah, I was going to do just a, a brief introduction if that's okay. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, go so ahead. Joel. Um, uh, so we were approached uh, with this project by our supervisor, Joel and I here at Western Carolina University. Um, last year, uh, she gave us kind of a job, some job descriptions and, and we were wondering if we could help out with this particular project. And I looked it over and I said that between Joel and I, I think we had most of the necessary skills that we could do. Um, my supervisor submitted an application for our small consortium, um, WNCLN, to join Project ReShare. And we uh, were accepted in March of this year. Um, from there, we kind of joined the development team in March. Um, and we've been working with them um, on sort of customizing the themes and the modules um, for ViewFind. Um, and that's what, what Joel's gonna talk about now. Oh, 
Joel, you're muted. Yep. Yes. Um, let me get my uh, slides up here. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do slides or not, but I decided I would at the last minute. So. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Present these. Um, so yeah, like Adam said, our background and skills. Um, we're both, you know, front-end web developers. Um, and with some PHP knowledge. And so it's a good fit for working with ViewFind, which is based on PHP. Um, so we kind of had a, an intro to ViewFind, um, really learning the ViewFind development you know, paradigm and how it works. Um, I'd heard about ViewFind when it first was being developed, but hadn't really worked with it much. And so um, getting into that and getting, uh, really learning what, how it works and ins and outs of the themes and the modules has been our a big focus um, for the first month or so. Uh, we initially had some issues running ViewFind in Windows, which we're both running on Windows. And um, so we ended up doing some troubleshooting there and uh, wrote some documentation for getting it up and running in Windows with Vagrant. Um, and we're actually now doing a lot of our work on the index data's development server, which is quite nice. It's running on Linux and it's uh, it's got all the um, different pieces there so we can kind of look at what's really running, <clears throat> excuse me, on the front end as well. It's used for the um, demos that Kristen does. Um, so our initial tasks for the two of us were uh, focus on standardizing the reshare viewfind module and theme. Um, and these the module and theme will serve as kind of a baseline for the future uh, reshare specific viewfind customizations. Uh, so accomplishments so far, uh, we've updated the module from Zend to the Laminus framework. Um, same framework basically, but a new name. So uh, we've done the updates there for those changes and um, expanded some of the readme documentation and then published all those to the uh, um, version control on GitHub. So our next steps, uh, we're starting on viewfind theme um, work. So it needs to be um, updated uh, the same way, updated from Zen to Laminus and um, committed to a new repository. It's not currently in uh, version control. So uh, we'll be doing that. And then we'll have a list of uh, fixes and enhancements to the theme that we'll be doing uh, once that is complete. And thank you. That's the update from WNCLN. Great, thank you to Joel and Adam. And then uh, next up we have Matthew. All right, let me share my screen here. All right, hi everybody. I'm Matthew Reedsma from Grand Valley State University. And um, just before, uh, at the end of the before times, uh, we met with uh, Kristen and other reshare folks uh, about joining and um, had some in-kind contributions for uh, me to do an accessibility audit of uh, the reshare project. And then of course, uh, the no longer before times happened. And so then, uh, uh, it kind of got put off until this year. And, and um, earlier this year, uh, I met with uh, uh, Kristen and Scott from MCLS. We kind of talked about what would be most useful for the development team for looking at accessibility. Um, at Grand Valley, when we are building web tools, um, you know, like a lot of you folks, we're doing two different things. Sometimes we're building things from scratch, which is ideal from an accessibility standpoint, as well as a usability standpoint. I feel like you can to kind of bake a lot of that stuff in. And then there's also the vendor stuff we get where we are trying to make things more accessible or more usable. So we're taking a product and reviewing it. So we do have a lot of experience um, in this realm. And if you're really interested, I'm gonna kind of just talk really briefly about what I did and kind of the deliverables that have come out so far and maybe kind of a roadmap of where this will go in the future. Um, but I also, uh, my colleague, um, Melina Zavala and I published an article in Code for Lib, I think last May, um, so about a year now, uh, on basically using uh, VPATs, which are voluntary product accessibility templates, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, from vendors to sort of uh, double check their work, make sure that they're doing um, their accessibility audits on the up and up. So that's kind of what some of the work on this was based on as well. So. Um, 
basically what I did um, to start with, I'm sorry, everything's flying out of my screen, is I started with what's called a VPAT template. So this is a, a document many of you may be familiar with. Vendors often supply them. Usually you have to ask them. They're always hidden on their website if they are publicly available. Um, and it basically is a spreadsheet that goes through all of the accessibility criteria for the uh, WCAG, um, um, either you know 2.0 or 2.1 accessibility criteria. So on the one hand, it would have, okay, if you want to target level A, which is very basic accessibility. I mean, everything should at the very least do all the stuff in A. Um, uh, most of the time we, we shoot for double A, which is a little, little better, you know, sort of the medium. Uh, you know, if you go to the car wash, it's the one that gives you the underbody wash and the wax. Um, so the single A, you know, we have all these criteria on the left side. And then I started just with a blank spreadsheet, basically. Um, this spreadsheet is obviously structured on those WCAG requirements, which you can find online. You can also get this VPAT template online. I think it's at section 508.gov. Um, but this is the very long and dry WCAG uh, requirements. If you do accessibility work, this will be your friend. Um, and so I, I got this spreadsheet. I inventoried all the reshare pages on the reshare demo site. So I was looking at all the different apps, the user apps, the um, supply apps, the um, request apps, and the Zoom toolbar wants to be in my way. Here we go. So I went through, I made sure I knew every view. So I'm looking at this screen here, and then I click in. Now I'm looking at a detail screen. I needed to know all these different pages so I could test each of these pages for all of the different requirements. Um, and I did that in a number of different ways. And some of it is automated, and some of it is manual. And so. Um, uh, one of the most, I guess, the easiest things I did was to use what's called the WAVE uh, toolbar. So the WAVE is the Web Accessibility Virtual Environment, maybe, I'm guessing. Maybe it doesn't actually stand for anything. But it's just a, a plugin you can add. And, and if you just go to a page, it'll basically run an automated um, check on that page and give you information on whether there are any accessibility errors. It'll have some alerts. And here's where things get tricky. These automated tools are really useful for looking for what are basically needles in haystacks. But here's the deal. Accessibility is often about some sort of interpretation, right? There's no, it's not like, um, you know, a pass fail um, always. Some things are and some things are not. So for instance, um, one accessibility requirement most people are familiar with is having alt text on an image. Well, that's true unless the image is decorative, in which case you don't put alt text because you're saying it's decorative, therefore it's not actually conveying any meaning. So the checker doesn't know if the image is um, decorative or not. So you have to make that call as somebody who's doing the actual accessibility. So there's a lot of different stuff we went through. Um, we all, I also tested this by combing through, um, you know, co combing through the, uh, the page itself, looking at page source, looking at the inspector, um, and double checking to see how things worked. I ran this through screen readers. I did a lot of manual testing with the keyboard to make sure things worked. And um, bottom line is reshare did pretty great. Um, I was telling um, Kristen that I think it might have been the, the best performance of any vendor tool I've ever tested. So um, good job. There were some things obviously that, that still need to be updated. Um, but for the first time ever on a vendor tool, every applicable um, accessibility criteria was at least partially supported. And um, that's not necessarily the case most of the time. Um, and most of those partially supports are, it supports in every case except for this one case where I found something happened. You know, So like in one instance, you can navigate this whole thing in a great way with the keyboard. Um, and see your your where the focus is on the screen um, quite well um, by tabbing through, unless you are actually in uh, this screen, in which case, once you get to the table headers, your focus disappears for a little while. I'm tabbing. You don't know that, but I really am. So all of a sudden, we pop back out. So it's just, it's just like the one section, like, oh, we're losing our focus there. So um, just looking for those types of things that can get put into the queue to get updated. And um, yeah, so the other idea behind the, the VPAT template was that because most vendors 
um, provide these and, and most libraries expect them at this point, I wanted to give them a starting place where they already have the structure for any sort of accessibility issues. So they can translate them into their project management software, but they sort of have a draft VPAT now that they can go in and work on. So I think that's it. Any questions? I don't see any questions yet, but thank you, Matthew. And mm -hmm. thank you for that that update. Um, we're, we're really pleased to hear that we did so well on that. And we also have a lot of thanks to give to Folio and their UI toolkit, yeah. which we borrowed. So uh, it's really nice to see how well that turned out. And so we actually have uh, one more presenter, Blake Graham Henderson, who thought he wasn't gonna be able to make it, but is here. So uh, Blake, you can go ahead and do your talk. And then if we have any final questions, we'll do those. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Yeah, like you said, I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to make it. I have another conference happening at the exact same time. <laughs> so um, I don't have any slides prepared, but I'll, I'll show my face. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Blake Graham Henderson. I uh, work at Mobius, which is in Missouri. We uh, are a consortial office for a fairly good sized consortium in Missouri. And we also handle um, an evergreen installation for various people across the country, uh, North Carolina and uh, Kentucky and whatnot. And um, we joined ReShare in March, I think much the same as another. And um, one of the first things that we're contributing and we're continuing to do is to lower the bar of getting more developers on board. Um, one of the sticking points was identified as installing the software was fairly rigorous and difficult. So our job is to make that easier. <laughs> So uh, we've um, shared out some code, um, which is it called reshare tools, reshare dash tools. It's on GitHub and it's um, ready for testing. We've gone through several phases. At this point, we have an extra wrapper tool that makes it even easier to install reshare with a one, one command um, start. So you type one command in and then you have a reshare server running on your development machine. At least that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, so that's where we are now. And I think that uh, my talk is going to be the very definition of a lightning talk. So that's it. That's it for me. Great. Thanks, Blake. Um, I mean, I know your your code that you're working on is on GitHub. Uh, as we send out a follow up for this meeting, is that something that you feel like I should share? Is that something you want people to take a look at at this point? Absolutely. Yeah, it's in okay. a place where, yeah, we're, we're listening uh, feedback from anybody who um, wants to take a gander at it, run run through the processes and, and give feedback. We have some enhancements on the roadmap for switching out pieces of reshare for your development version, making that easier things like that. Great, thanks. So we'll we'll include that um, as we send out some links as a follow-up to this meeting. Uh, so to wrap things up, just gonna quickly show a couple of things. So, um, you know, following on these conversations with our community contributors, I just wanted to, one, say thank you to them for the work that they've done. It's been really valuable to the project. It's helped us do work uh, that we wouldn't have had time for just relying on our core team and also, you know, help expand our expertise in areas like, you know, UX and things where we might not have had a person who is really prepared to do that. Um, and so I did want to highlight, um, we have a, our Get Involved page. There's a section on here of technical skills needed that does list uh, a few potential roles that we see as being ones that could be good for future community contributors. Um, you know, in terms of just core front and back end developers, um, if people are interested in contributing a developer, that's something we would be very interested in as well. 
And especially if you're thinking about joining the project and are interested in an in-kind contribution, that would be a, a great way to do that. And you can link to some more detail here. Um, there's a, a link here to the wiki that has fuller descriptions of these. Um, you know, we could also use somebody who might be more of a front ender to help with some of the HTML and CSS on the site. Uh, we could also use somebody to help us maintaining this WordPress site for the project. So that's a little bit, again, on the, the outskirts of the project, but something that we could use help with. Um, and so I hope that these presentations gave you a good sense of the kinds of models of the types of projects people can do with ReShare. And we're certainly open to other proposals. If you have an idea, you have somebody, or you are somebody who has a, an interesting way you could contribute to ReShare, please do get in touch with us um, and we'd be happy to talk about that more. Um, and that really just brings us to our uh, thank you slide. Uh, to, to say thank you for coming and please get in touch if you need any more information. And we do have um, just a few minutes left. If there are any final questions, uh, we can address those now before we wrap up. Sorry, Tim, go ahead. I'm sorry, there don't, don't, there don't appear to be any questions uh, left in the, in the Q&A. Okay, then I think we're good for now. So thank you again, everybody for coming and, and do get in touch if um, you wanna get involved with ReShare or we can answer any additional questions for you. Thanks and take care everybody.